What's up, people? Welcome to episode six. Six of Like a House of Fire, a periodic video cast. Here on CageSideSeats.com, the best damn pro wrestling community on the internet. My name is Sean Ruder. Uh, you can get me on Twitter at S1Rude. And I am the host of said video cast. I apologize if you haven't been here in a while. It's been about a week since I brought one of these to you. And uh, also missed out on our usual weekly post raw podcast last night with my partner Matt Raw. Uh, so that's not the plan. We want to be doing these more often and hopefully we will going forward. So there you have it. This is the one where I endeavor to not say so and uh, so much because boy did I say that a lot in the last one. Anyway, uh, I had a few things in mind. I didn't don't really have one of the reasons I haven't been on is I haven't really had like a burning topic, even though we had about a bunch of hot news last week about the WWE network. The TNA stuff was still falling down, falling apart, falling over, um, all of the above. But I, I had an I got an idea for sort of a longer form thing that I hope to get get done later this week. Sort of inspired by the um, tremendous thumbs up movie uh, Guardians of the Galaxy that I've we were so and really enjoyed a lot this past weekend. But that's for another time. There's a few things that were on my mind that I you know, thought it could spur some conversation here on the site, so I fired up the old HD cam, and um, one thing is like, related to the WWE Network, I mean, I do think that, um, there I did it, um, that the financial numbers and the conference call that they came out with last week is about the best that they can spin it at this point, it is, uh, it's going to be an uphill battle, but they should have known that, I mean, that's really their only failure, is sort of setting expectations too high, I think, at this point, they need to innovate the product, they need to get into new markets, they need to keep their core product strong, and I think they're taking steps to do all of those things. It sucks that that results in people losing their jobs, but and that's that's capitalism for you. So that's not something we can really rail on WWE too much for. That's that's the nature of the beast. Um, so they're I mean they're trying. One thing that this parlayed itself into was last night's nine ninety nine episode of, of WWE Monday Night Raw, which, you know, drove a lot of us up the wall and was was kind of cheesy and a little bit funny at first, but quickly sort of lost its luster. But I'm hoping that really that that, that it is that that is market research driven, that somewhere they had something that said that their core audience was not grasping what the cost was and that this was a way to, to drive that home. Also, one of the um, the pricing alternatives that they suggested on the on the conference call was a, a one-time fee of I think it's I think they were saying 19.99 maybe or 20.99 to to buy it to buy the network for a one-time basis, essentially just for a month to get a pay-per-view that you like. So you know, right before SummerSlam, you buy the one-time deal for 20, 20 or 21 bucks instead of the 9.99 a month with the commitment, and that this was their way to set the the baseline, make sure everybody knows it's $9.99 if you promise to stick with it for a little while so that there's a, you know, they create the contrast when they announce that pricing plan. Uh, like I said, I hope it's not, it wasn't just a just a rib on the fans that they were going to take an evening and, you know, cram it up our butts with um, not funny jokes and even Triple H smirking. Not that the Triple H smirking is a bad thing, but in this case, it it could be if there wasn't a purpose. So that's my take on that. Um, uh, the other topic that's, you know, coming around a lot because Paul Heyman's out there. I'm, I'm pretty excited to see his DVD. I guess it drops today. Paul Heyman. Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Paul Heyman. Um, the clips that we've gotten look really cool. This is, you know, his the story of his career is kind of the story of, of modern, you know, pro wrestling the fandom, the, the type of fans that most of us are, you know, bringing up ECW and getting, you know, where, where they really, that kind of crowd interaction that has become the staple of, you know, what we think of as smart crowds or in, in hot cities like Chicago and New York, that, that can, you can trace the roots of that back to how ECW interacted with their fans. And that sort of, you know, that level of, of wanting to get behind the scenes and the, the sort of work shoot stuff that I think is is a state what we think of as a staple of, of the form and the business now I think that started with with Heyman so watching him um, hearing the story of his rise from his perspective and from some of the people who he's you know 
interacted with and fought with at times and those sorts of things is going to be great. But anyway, the um, you know, he's t you know the questions come up with him a lot. You know, the two guys he's most associated with in the last five or so years. You know, more so in one guy's case, Brock Lesnar, uh, which I, we'll talk more about that next week as we get closer to SummerSlam. But and the other guy is Punk, and you know, everybody who's saying stop talking about him, I don't care, all these things, you know, you took the time to click on an article to say that you didn't care, so not to, not to start a, you know, a war with anybody, but people do care, and that's pretty obvious, so anybody who says that they don't, or that nobody does, isn't paying attention, or isn't very self-aware of themselves. Um, anyway, I think, I, I think, as I wrote in the, in the piece today that I'll, I'll put the link to, Underneath the YouTube video and the cage side post, you know, I think that most of us accept that he will probably be back at some time, at some date, at some date. I'm a little surprised that they're talking about it as being, an, you know, an acrimonious split now. I, I had sort of bought into the thinking that, you know, maybe he did go to Vince and say, I'm banged up and I'm burnt out. Let me go. And Vince said, OK, we'll keep making money off your merch and things will be good. Now, Heyman's latest interviews are making it sound like it's not like that. That maybe, maybe it started like that, and the fact, and Vince thought it would be give me back in a couple months, and when he wasn't, things got bitter. Um, so that's, you know, that's out there, and that's probably gonna make it so that anybody who was hoping for a WrestleMania 31 return is probably gonna be disappointed. But as we've seen with Ultimate Warrior, as we've seen with Bret Hart, guys, that there was a lot more legitimate heat and like, I mean, real ugliness between them and the company or them and Vince. Those bridges were were rebuilt when legacies were at stake, when money could be made, and I think the same thing will eventually be true with Punk. It may be five years down the road. I don't know, um, but I, that's just my belief. I got I got nothing, got no insight on the situation other than the same stuff that everybody else has read. I might think about it a little bit more because I'm a freak, but other than that, that's just my gut. So that's part of what this thing is about, in my opinion. And that's my opinion on that, is I do think he'll be back at some point when the deal is right and or when there's a Hall of Fame thing at stake. And right now he's enjoying the podcasts and the red carpets and those sorts of things. But at some point, the thing that got him that fame, he's going to be worried about how that is remembered. And WWE is probably going to control that. I believe that they will. I think the network will, will last and that they'll continue to be the dominant force in the industry. But on the subject of my opinions, I will also go out there and throw you know, one last thing at you, which is that you know there's an angle that has main evented Raw the last two weeks, and shockingly it involves um, some female performers, and that's a great thing. It's a really good thing. It shows that you know WWE is is willing to embrace something other than their bread and butter, which is you know sweaty dudes grabbing each other. Um, so that's cool. I mean, that's a great thing, and um, and I, like most people, am really enjoying Stephanie McMahon's performance in this angle. I don't know that she is the second coming of Vince or anything else at this point, but she's doing great work, and she deserves some props for it. I, I definitely, you know, she's holding up her end of the angle a lot more than anybody else, which is my beef. Of all the people, of all the divas, whatever you want to call them, that, that could have gotten this spot. Why did it have to be the Bellas? <sighs> I get that it makes sense, and that's, I think I've said, maybe if, if not on here, then in writing, that my favorite part of the angle is that it reminds me that Daniel Bryan exists. You know, Bree mentions him every once in a while. There's a thematic tie-in to the Bryan versus Authority angle that drove most of last year and took us into WrestleMania 30. Um, so that, yeah, but she's not, or he's not coming out the other side of this as a money-making star. I guess, other than the Brian connection, it's the love of Total Divas, and that being either a profitable enterprise for them or a vision for the future that they see as something that they can, you know, build off of, but... God, I mean, she's horrible. Uh, she's a serviceable worker at times. I don't know that um, that their match at SummerSlam is going to do anything other 
anything to change anybody's minds about women's wrestling. I don't. I hope it's not a complete train wreck that sets them back. But I think that's a possibility because, you know, Steph is not somebody who works all the time. She's older than she was. And her best matches were with the best of the best the WWE has ever offered, like Trish Stratus. Um, so, you know, I don't think she's carrying anybody to a match. I hope that with the time they've had to plan this, which if you go with the rumors, has been is going back months, that they've been in the lab working with Sarah Del Rey, getting ready to knock this thing out of the park. Because... If it's as bad as I fear it could be, you know, it's going to be bathroom break jokes again when they've invested a lot in it this time, too. Not just when they've thrown some segments at the screen and then gave them a two-minute pay-per-view spot and LOL bathroom break. Uh, you gave them two raw main event spots and then you crap the bed. That's a problem. The other problem is, is that, God, it's pretty horrible on the mic. And that's not serviceable. That's nothing. She's, in, you know, shouldn't be speaking in public kind of a thing. And she's not, they've invested all this in somebody who is not going to be a draw on the other side of it, at least not in a wrestling ring or in a wrestling show. This spot should have gone to somebody. Um, AJ Lee is not much of a worker. She sells pretty well, but at least she's got charisma. She can talk. She's somebody they can bank on going forward. Paige, um, you know, without being a total NXT nerd, which I am. By the way, screw you, Randall Hartman, over in the rumors department. I'll be an NXT nerd if I want to. You know, people like Bailey, Sasha Banks, even Summer Rae, who's another not good worker, but knows how to, you know, connect with the audience and have charisma. Somebody like that, if you're going to give this this huge build and these raw main events and this the return to the ring for Stephanie McMahon and on and on and on. There should be a payoff on the other side of it, because I'm assuming, especially with the way that Braun did last night, that Brie will be victorious, if not at SummerSlam, at some point in the future beyond that. And then what? What? You've got this unlikable... I mean, their best work has always been as heels. Even when they've tried to be faces when they were feuding with AJ last year, most people treated them like heels, the Bella Twins. So I just, it's a, it's a, it's not a wise investment as far as I can, in my opinion. And that's all that is, is my opinion. Like, God damn it. This, I mean, this feud should have been with AJ, in my personal opinion. I'm a bit of an AJ mark, but she is somebody who is a bankable star going forward. And that they teased it, they teased it years ago. I mean, when her and they had a little interaction on the, on the stage, oh, that would have been such a hot feud. And, you know, if they could have had three months to plot out a match and gotten a decent 10 minute job out of it, I mean, then on the other side of that, you know, the sky's the limit of what you could do with AJ. I don't think that same thing is true with Bree, so I'm bummed about that. So that rains on my parade with that. I'm not, so I'm not quite as high on that angle as a lot of people are, but, you know, good for them for trying something different. Kudos to Steph for good work. So um, we'll see. We I hope they don't. Uh, embarrass themselves at SummerSlam, and maybe Brie will prove me wrong. I think Punk will be back in about 2019. I think the WWE Network will be all right if nobody panics and pulls the plug on it too early, and they keep doing, you know, the next right thing with it, so to speak, you know, seeing what customers want and trying to deliver on that. And that's what I got. So thanks for watching and listening. Tell your friends, hide your kids, hide your wives, and deal with it.